Well, hallelujah and blessings, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. And Jesus, the Messiah, he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together the people of God say, hallelujah. Now we're continuing our study on the book of Enoch. We have begun parable number three, and we are today in chapter 60. I will place a link in the description box if you'd like to follow along with us. So if you have your Bible and the book of Enoch, specifically chapter 60, open in front of you. Let's begin reading at verse 1. Now it says, In the year 500, in the seventh month, on the fourteenth day of the month, in the life of Enoch. So this is roughly 500 years after the creation of Adam. Now I'll point this out because I want you to understand when we read the Gospels, Jesus arrived on the scene 4,000 years after the creation of Adam. When we read of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, David, all of these patriarchs of the faith, thousands of years after the creation of Adam. But Enoch is writing this when Adam is still alive. Noah is alive. Methuselah is alive. So these are in the very early days of mankind, friend. And since the origin of these pages dates so far back, so early on in the creation of man, they play a very key role in the story of God among men. And that's what Enoch is reminding us of here. He says, in that parable, I saw how a mighty quaking made the heaven of heavens to quake, and the host of the Most High, and the angels, a thousand thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand were disquieted with a great disquiet. Now, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 11, we read, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. Now, that is John the Revelator writing his vision down for us, and yet Enoch says basically the same thing. He says, I saw in the heavens a mighty quaking, and the host, and the Most High, and the angels, a thousand thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand, were disquieted with a great disquiet. And the head of days sat on the throne of his glory. And the angels and the righteous stood around him. And a great trembling seized me, and fear took hold of me. And my loins gave way, and dissolved were my reins. And I fell upon my face. Isn't that what John told us in Revelation chapter 1 verse 17? He says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And the parallels between the book of Revelation and the book of Enoch are so closely, so tightly knit that sometimes you think you're reading the same text. Well, it goes on in verse 4 of 1 Enoch, and he says, Michael sent another angel. Now, this is Michael the archangel sent another angel from among the holy ones, and he raised me up. And when he had raised me up, my spirit returned. For I had not been able to endure the look of this host and the commotion and the quaking of the heaven. And Michael said unto me, Why art thou disquieted with such a vision? Until this day lasted the day of his mercy. And he hath been merciful and long-suffering towards those who dwell on the earth. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, it reads, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee to repentance? And that's what Michael the archangel says here. He says, Until this day lasted the day of his mercy, and he hath been merciful and long suffering towards those who dwell on the earth. I can't speak for you, friend, but I know in my own life there were many rebellious days. There were even days of confusion, days where I felt lost and on my own. Yet in these days of my defiance in the face of the Most High, he was merciful and patient, long-suffering toward me. And I'm so grateful that he was. And there are those among us today, friends, family that we know, and they shake their fist in the face of God. And yet he is merciful and long-suffering to them. And there may be a day when we see that shaken fist turn into bended knees, for that's truly what we're praying for. And as he was patient with us, so he is being patient with them and so many others. And for that, our hearts sing, hallelujah, praise the Most High for putting up with such vile creatures as us. 
He says in verse 6, when the day and the power and the punishment and the judgment come, which the Lord of spirits has prepared for those who worship not the righteous law and for those who deny the righteous judgment and for those who take his name in vain, that day is prepared for the elect a covenant, a divine promise in other words, but for sinners an inquisition, a judicial inquiry. When the punishment of the Lord of Spirits shall rest upon them, it shall rest in order that the punishment of the Lord of Spirits may not come in vain. And it shall slay the children with their mothers and their children with their fathers. Afterwards, the judgment shall take place according to his mercy and his patience. And so what he's saying here is that there is a purpose to the judgment of God. Now, if you look at Romans chapter 9 and we pick up at verse 22, it says, What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. So basically it's saying that God is going to show his power and his wrath because some have been prepared and fitted for destruction and he will exercise his wrath and his power upon them. And that is the purpose of their creation. Now, whether you like it or not, friends, whether that settles well with you or not, that's what the Bible says. In verse 23, it says, and that he make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared before unto glory. So we're being told here there have been some fitted to destruction so that God's power and wrath may be known. And there have been some fitted unto glory so that his mercy and goodness will be known. And that's what Enoch says here. He says again in verse 6, When the day and the power and the punishment and the judgment come, which the Lord of Spirits has prepared for those who worship not the righteous law and for those who deny the righteous judgment and for those who take his name in vain, that day is prepared for the elect of covenant, the sinners in inquisition, when the punishment of the Lord of Spirits shall rest upon them, it shall rest in order that the punishment of the Lord of Spirits may not come in vain. There is a purpose to that day. And it says afterwards, the judgment shall take place according to his mercy and his patience. Now on that day, there were two monsters that were parted, a female monster named Leviathan to dwell in the abyss of the ocean over the fountains of the waters. But the male is named Behemoth, who occupied with his breast a waste wilderness named Duduan, on the east of the garden where the elect and righteous dwell. We will dwell among the garden, not specifically in the kingdom of heaven. He says, this will take place where my grandfather was taken up. Who is he talking about? Adam, the seventh from Adam, the first man whom the Lord of Spirits created. So the grandfather of Enoch was Adam. Do you see how close this is to the very beginning? how true these words should ring. He says in verse 9, I besought the other angel that he should show me the might of those monsters, how they were parted or separated on one day and cast the one into the abyss of the sea and the other unto the dry land of the wilderness. Now in Job chapter 40 verse 15, we read, Behold now behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. So he is a land monster. Now, if we look at Isaiah chapter 27, verse one, it says, in that day, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, that piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. So behemoth has been created for the land. Leviathan has been created for the sea. Do we know what these creatures are exactly? No, we don't. The Bible doesn't define them clearly. And right here at this stage in the book of Enoch, he doesn't either. But he does say, I besought the other angel that he should show me the might of those monsters, how they were parted on one day, one being cast into the abyss of the sea and the other upon dry land of the wilderness. And he said to me, thou son of man, herein thou dost seek to know what is hidden. And the other angel who went with me and showed me what was hidden told me what is first and last in the heaven in the height and beneath the earth in the depth and at the ends of the heaven and on the foundation of the heaven. 
And so we're going to repeat some of the information that we've already discussed because we're going to talk about the thunders, we're going to talk about the lightnings, we're going to talk about the frost, we're going to talk about the dew. And that's what Enoch is transcribing for us here or trying to describe for us is this vision that he's seen of where these things begin and where they end. So in verse 12, he says, the chambers of the winds and how the winds are divided, how they are weighed and how the portals of the winds are reckoned each according to the power of the wind and the power of the lights of the moon and according to the power that is fitting and the divisions of the stars according to their names and how all the divisions are divided and the thunders according to the places where they fall and all the divisions that are made among the lightnings that it may lighten and their host that they may at once obey for the thunder has places of rest which are assigned to it while it is waiting for its peal or its loud burst of noise and the thunder and lightning are inseparable and although not one and undivided, they both go together through the spirit and separate not. For when the lightning lightens, the thunder utters its voice and the spirit enforces a pause during the peal or again the loud burst of noise and divides equally between them. For the treasury of their peals, or these loud bursts of noise, is like the sand. And each one of them, as it peals, is held in with a bridle, and turned back by the power of the Spirit, and pushed forward according to the many quarters of the earth. And the Spirit of the sea is masculine and strong, and according to the might of his strength he draws it back with a rein. And in like manner, it is driven forward and disperses amid all the mountains of the earth. And the spirit of the hoarfrost is his own angel. And the spirit of the hell is a good angel. And the spirit of the snow has forsaken his chambers on account of his strength. There is a special spirit therein, and that which ascends from it is like smoke. And its name is frost. And the spirit of the mist is not united with them in their chambers, but it has a special chamber for its course is glorious both in light and in darkness and in winter and in summer. And in this chamber is an angel and the spirit of the dew has its dwelling at the ends of the heaven and is connected with the chambers of the rain and its course is in winter and summer and its clouds and the clouds of the mist are connected. The one gives to the other. And when the spirit of the rain goes forth from its chamber, the angels come and open the chamber and lead it out. And when it is diffused over the whole earth, it unites with the water on the earth. And whensoever it unites with the water on the earth, for the waters are for those who dwell on the earth, for they are nourishment for the earth from the Most High who is in heaven. Therefore, there is a measure for the rain, and the angels take it in charge. And these things I saw towards the garden of the righteous. And the angel of peace who was with me said to me, These two monsters, Leviathan and Behemoth, prepared conformably to the greatness of God, shall feed. And that's the end of chapter 60. Now, the first half of chapter 60 was much more explainable and maybe even understandable than the latter half of chapter 60, because it appears that the latter half of chapter 60 speaks specifically with a lot of information that we would call today scientific, meteorology. And if I had a scientific mind, if I understood meteorology, I may be able to break this down and explain it to you better. I have to apologize because I'm not a scientist and I'm not a meteorologist. But what I can tell you is that it is, a, it is a stated fact that thousands of scientists are leaving the idea of evolution in the fact that we came from a distant planet, that a big bang and, and those types of things, and they are adhering and, and starting to surrender to the teaching of the Bible because every day the more science proves, the more science proves the Bible. These mysteries of how the winds start, where they go, what happens with the thunder and the lightning and the rain and dew, they have all been recorded specifically in the Bible for us, and it appears even in the book of Enoch for us. And the more researchers and scientists learn, it seems they are discovering these things have always been in the Bible 
but we didn't understand how to interpret them because our understanding hadn't come to the place where science is as of yet. Does that make sense? If it confuses you, rest assured, friends, it confuses me just as much. But there are those who do understand such things as what we have discussed today, and there's no contradiction in what we are discovering and learning through science. That's the point. Science doesn't contradict the Bible, and the Bible doesn't contradict science. They are confirming one another. They are working within one another. And so scientists who think that they are becoming more advanced in the things that they are learning because of the things that they are learning, the Bible has said it all along. So science is merely catching up with the Bible. And so one last way to put that would be science says, oh, I get it. And the Bible simply says, see, I told you so. <laughs> Hallelujah. Our God is so good, so big, and so patient with such vile creatures as us who think we've got it all figured out. When we haven't begun to scratch the surface on the mysteries of God and his ways. Well, friends, we're going to end there today. Chapter 60. We'll pick up in chapter 61 the next time we're together. In our study, we are about halfway through the book of First Enoch, and I trust and pray that you are growing in your relationship with the Lord Jesus each and every day because of this study. And if anything, what you should be learning is the story hasn't changed over time. The plan has not been altered. It's been the same from the beginning. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we are part of this glorious plan. He has chosen us, brought us out of darkness, and placed us in the light. And day by day, he opens our eyes to new truths and new revelations. And the purpose of this is so that we can become more faithful followers of Jesus. We can live more faithfully before him. We can be filled with his spirit so that we can have power over things that would bring disobedience in our lives before the Most High. And we can exercise the necessary disciplines required to prove our allegiance to him. That's the purpose of this study, friends, and I pray that's what's taking place in your life. Now, I love you, and I'm so thankful that you decided to join us this morning. I ask that you would continue to pray for us so that we can be faithful in bringing you the Word of God each and every day as He so wills. Now, may you walk faithfully before and with your Lord and King throughout this day as He wills, and until next time, I'll see you on the next video.